Good afternoon, good evening to our online audience, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I see that the um, the webinar is is slowly populating. People will be joining us, uh, I imagine, over the next over the next uh, minute or two. Uh, and I'll just take this opportunity to make a few introductory remarks before our um, speaker begins her presentation. So I'd like to welcome you, first of all, on behalf of the Wirth Institute for Austrian and Central European Studies to this webinar today. My name is Alex Carpenter. I'm the director of the Institute. Uh, this week is, uh, this is the beginning. This is the very first event in our uh, annual week of Jewish studies uh, programming. We have uh, a week of Jewish studies in the fall every year, and then we have a second week in the late winter spring. And so this is our kickoff event and we're very um we're very excited about it very excited to welcome you and um to have our to have our guest speaker with us today uh, the topic of today's talk in hiding jewish survival in occupied poland during world war ii and our very special speaker is uh, joanna krul komwa who uh comes to us from poland today uh where she is the head of the digital collection department at the Poland. Museum in Warsaw. Joanna graduated from Warsaw University in Polish literature and linguistics, Jewish history and culture. Her main research interest is in Polish Holocaust documentary literature and oral history. Joanna has worked at the uh, Poland Museum of the History of Polish Jews since 2010, developing the museum's digital repository resource center and the website's virtual shtetl and the Polish Righteous, which together have had over 1.4 million visitors per year from all around the world. She's the author of short documentary films and articles about Holocaust stories in German-occupied Poland. And Joanna believes that sharing factual, reliable information about history contributes to the building of a civil society, which is responsible for its past and for its current actions. Um, the Poland Museum was established in Warsaw, if I'm not mistaken, in 2005. Um, and in 2016, it uh, received the European Museum of the Year Award. And just before um, Joanna begins, I just wanted to um, just read a very short uh, paragraph from, from the Polin Museum's um, website where it uh, um, describes itself, and I think uh, describes itself quite beautifully and um, captures something of... of what we will will hear and talk about in today's presentation, and um, what we are trying to do here in particular at the at the Worth Institute as we as we support and sponsor Jewish studies. The museum is a modern institution of culture. It is a historical museum, which presents the thousand years of Jewish life in the Polish lands. It is also a place of meeting and dialogue among those who wish to explore the past and present Jewish culture, those eager to draw conclusions for the future from Polish Jewish history, and finally those who are ready to face the stereotypes and oppose xenophobia and nationalistic prejudices that threaten today's societies. By promoting the ideas of openness, tolerance, and truth, Polin Museum contributes to the mutual understanding and respect among Poles and Jews. I think that's beautifully said. Um, and uh, I won't say any more, but I will uh, invite Joanna to begin her presentation and, and thank you so much for joining us and we're really honored that you are helping us to uh, launch our Jewish Studies Week. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander and Sylvia for inviting me. I feel really pleased and honored. Um, and uh, uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will just start my presentation. Um, if there will be any technical uh, issues, I know somebody will alarm me on the chat. So let me uh, first uh, share my presentation. I hope it works. Oh, sorry. Um, why it is not the beginning? Sorry, sorry, something messed out uh, with the... Yes, that's the beginning, hopefully, yes. 
so uh, my uh, topic for today is um, in hiding. I will talk about Jewish people in hiding and how they were able to survive in German-occupied Poland during World War II. Um, uh, and I uh, decided to uh, prepare this presentation on the base of collection uh, which we have at our museum. Uh, these are a collection of testimonies and uh, objects uh, which are related specifically to this uh, topic of Jewish people hiding in, uh, in Poland. And uh, the, uh, the first um, slide is, uh, um, is, a, is a picture of a Jewish family uh, hiding somewhere at the attic or maybe in the basement. Uh, it was uh, created by Zuzanna Kofta, a Polish Jewish artist. Um, it's ink on paper. And uh, um, at some point we asked the artist to, to prepare this um, um, drawings for us. It's a series of drawings because we realized it's very difficult to find iconography, which would uh, tell us the truth about how this uh, hiding looked like. Um, because uh, we are in this type of a topic where hiding is a part of hiding. So uh, not much of photos. Nobody was taking pictures of uh, himself or herself and uh, not, not that easy to, uh, to present the topic. So we um, uh, were recording testimonies of Jewish people who survived the Holocaust in Poland. And at some point, we uh, realize uh, that we uh, we have difficulty of the so-called representation of the topic. So uh, um, uh, hiding uh, in uh, uh, in in case of uh, of, of Polish uh, Jewish Jewish Polish people population uh, is uh, is uh, um, located in the time of the Second World War II. And in case of Poland, uh, the war broke out uh, on the 1st of September 1939. And in the ca case of Polish uh, Jews, uh, some uh, restrictions against them uh, was already implemented uh, in October 1939, when the first ghetto, uh, so-called closed uh, neighborhood, was created. That was in Piotrków Trybunalski. Today it is a, a Łódź uh, region, Łódzkie region in uh, central Poland. And uh, imagine it was um, almost uh, since the beginning uh, a time uh, for uh, for hiding because very quickly Jewish people understood that uh, probably nobody will stay alive from those who are crammed in the ghettos. So uh, very quickly, some of them made a decision not to hide, uh, not to not to go to this ghetto. And uh, the second uh, object, um, I will present you some objects and photos uh, we were able to collect in our institution. Um, uh, and then uh, at the end of my presentation, I will show the film. Um, significant one, because it is about the woman who, for, uh, who survived the war in Poland and she was hiding the facts she was hiding for, for many years. So hiding in hiding. Um, the second object I would like to present is uh, this attic uh, calendar. Um, imagine if, if you can see me a uh, kind of visit card. Um, so, 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 so you see something really big, but actually uh, uh, it was something really small. This is a small object which is presented at our core exhibition uh, somewhere at the end of the Holocaust gallery. This is a visit card of one lady who was helping another person, a Jewish woman called Celina Glitzberg. And Celina uh, was in Wutsk. This is now in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, before the war, uh, east uh, part of Poland. And uh, this Jewish woman was uh, counting uh, weeks, she, uh, days and weeks she stays in hiding. And uh, when uh, she ran out of this paper, of this visit card, she was removing everything and put these lines again. Uh, um, she was hiding many, many months and uh, in darkness. And uh, this attic calendar uh, was a way for her uh, 
uh, to somehow also count what is the day of the day of the week and what is happening to her and the last um like an entry is uh, somewhere in march 90 uh, 1944 where the red army uh, entered uh, wotsk and for jewish people uh, that was a time where they could live from the hiding place. They still were not so safe, but um, in most uh, cases, they didn't need to hide anymore. Uh, although they stay, they, they, they had to stay um, somehow, uh, they had to still be aware of the dangers that might happen with, uh, for instance, the local, uh, local um, uh, community around. So, um, mm, to, to return maybe to some so so I, I show you this this attic calendar because I think it's really uh it it shows it presents how it was to at least it tries to represent how it was to be in hiding for many 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 months and uh, you need to imagine what is what is happening in 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 occupied German occupied Poland in the beginning of the war? So the German people decided to build this close neighborhoods, the ghettos, and uh, suddenly in uh, major big big uh, cities, uh, the wall is being built. Here I am presenting you uh, our uh, a part of our collection. It's something completely new. Uh, which by miracle we found at the at the beginning of this year, 2023. So these are photos of Rudolf Dametz, a Polish um, photographer, uh, amateur photographer, who was um, uh, taking photos in Warsaw uh, exactly in this week of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in April uh, 1943. Uh, you can see... Uh, people, uh, this, the so-called bystanders, looking at the ghetto, looking what is behind the wall and uh, observing uh, what is happening to Jewish uh, people during this time. Um, the, this, this ghetto in Warsaw was the biggest, nearly 400,000 people were crammed. The second biggest one was in Łódź, uh, nearly 200,000 people. And uh, starting in the autumn of 1941, Jewish people were uh, punished by death for leaving the ghetto. So uh, quite early. Um, and uh, they had to make this decision uh, to, stay, uh, to stay in the ghetto or to hide in the so-called Aryan site. Um, also, in this autumn of 1941, providing Jewish people uh, with help uh, or shelter or even kind of immediate support was forbidden under uh, the threat of severe punishment, including death penalty. So this is a, this is a kind of um, landscape that people, uh, uh, Jewish people had to go through uh, in the beginning of uh, the war. And... Uh, I would like to quote uh, a famous now a famous a Jewish Polish Jewish uh, Jewish Polish historian Emanuel Ringelblum. Uh, he was a co-creator of the famous archive of the Warsaw Ghetto, and uh, he was able to um, smuggle himself to the so-called Aryan side. He was uh, at some point hiding in a bunker called Krysha. It was in Ohota. This is one of the districts of Warsaw. And in the autumn of 1943, Emanuel Ringelblum uh, in hiding wrote, when a Jew found himself on the Aryan side, there were two possible choices he could make, uh, he could take. He or she could either remain on the surface or live underground. So, uh, this is uh, this is uh, exactly what happened to Jewish people, uh, and I will tell you about the fate of both of these groups who decided to live underground, or had to live underground, uh, or those who uh, remain on the surface, because there were certain uh, special conditions. Um, if you want to stay uh, um, on the surface, uh, it was obviously really important to have false, uh, so-called false um, uh, papers um, or uh, false identity. And here I wanted to show you uh, Leon Feiner's scan card. Um, 
uh, Leon Feiner uh, was a he was a co-creator of a Jagota, which was a special group uh, 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 providing help for Jewish people in hiding. And he had this uh, Aryan document uh, so he could uh, stay on the surface and he could even uh, work actively on uh, rescuing Jewish people during the war. Uh, and obviously having such a document was important thing to have um, a, a home army, a Polish underground army was providing uh, such uh, false uh, documents, false IDs. Uh, so that was one of the conditions to have this um, uh, false ID and to start acting as a Christian person, to know the prayers in some, uh, some women, men or children were dyeing their hair to become blonde. It was important, of course, to have so-called good look, blue eyes, uh, and 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 uh, and blonde hair, of course, preferably. Um, it was important to know all the prayers, obviously, and um, uh, to speak fluently uh, Polish language. Um, most of Jewish people, there were three million Jewish people uh, who lived in Poland before the war, uh, spoke Yiddish. So uh, only those people actually who were highly assimilated had bigger chances to survive and to stay on the surface. Um, and um, as of uh, as of uh, hiding uh, uh, hiding in the in the city, uh, going to this perspective of uh, living uh, to live underground, like Emanuel Ringelblum, he lived in a kind of bunker. Uh, but this uh, bu building a bunker is a kind of issue which is an ongoing issue in the history of short history of the ghetto because Jewish uh, people were building bunkers and shelters already in the ghetto to avoid uh, roundups. German people were provoking such roundups for many reasons and um, uh, till uh, summer of 1942 when they have made the decision to liquidate the ghettos. Uh, such shelters were already helpful. So the Jewish people had some practice on how to build a shelter. And then they could, uh, if they were able to, uh, to, to go to the Aryan site, they had already kind of practice and they could build a shelter on their own. Obviously, if they have an apartment. Uh, it was obviously crucial uh, to have some Polish friends or some Polish helpers um, and not with whom they might not be friends uh, to uh, create a safe space to survive. So uh, here I wanted to show you a sketch by Czesława Żak. She's a, she's a Polish, she, she, she passed away, unfortunately. She uh, is a, a, a Polish person recognized with the Yad Vashem um, title, Righteous Among the Nations. And this is in our collection, uh, Mrs. Czesława Żak, she, 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 she drew this for us. And as you can see, uh, she lived in a quite spacious apartment. Uh, there were many, uh, many, here's some, some Warsztat Stolarski is like carpentry workshop. Uh, here is a, a room number one, room number two. Room number three, there where there was a storage for uh, for furnitures, and here uh, she marked uh, a room which was somehow uh, hidden uh, inside this apartment. Uh, so from the outside, uh, it seems that nobody lives there, and the fourteen people lived there. She gave uh, help to forty Jewish fourteen Jewish people. So. Um, so this is this I, I I wanted to present it to you to, to 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 so so you can see and visualize how it was to build a hiding place in a big city like Warsaw. Um, by the way, Warsaw obviously is believed as it was a capital that it was the biggest city in which uh, it was uh, easier to find a help. It was easier to get false papers. It was easier to stay on the surface and get a job as a Jewish person under Christian identity. And it was easier to live underground because a big, uh, a big city with many buildings um, uh, around. And uh, I wanted to uh, present you with a few more aspects of how this hiding looked like. Um, I mentioned this special conditions uh, that a Jewish person had to, in a way, fulfill to, um, to hide safely on the surface. 
uh, uh, but in many testimonies, Jewish people uh, recall that it was also important not to present your fear, uh, that, that the, the worst uh, thing to have was to um, show other people uh, that you are afraid of uh, something because you are Jewish, because you are you know that actually you should not be here. And uh, uh, I wanted to show you the, the photo of uh, Liliana Alter and Anna Stupnicka, um, these two uh, teenagers, uh, Liliana to the left uh, and Anna to the right. Um, uh, Anna Stupnicka, uh, mother, uh, the Polish one, uh, um, had some contacts with Jewish people in the ghetto. Uh, he was, uh, she was working as a kind of administration uh, worker in, uh, she had to collect some bills in the ghetto, so she had a special pass. She could freely enter and leave the ghetto. And one, on one of these uh, occasions, she uh, decided to help uh, Mr. Alter, uh, who asked her to smuggle her his his daughter. So um, Anna Stupnicka mother um, uh, and Anna and Janina uh, went to the ghetto. Uh, they met the Alter family there. Uh, the girls exchanged the codes, and at some point they were somehow able to leave the um, the ghetto. And uh, it was possible for Liliana to uh, stay as a cousin. So officially, all the neighbors knew, okay, this is a cousin. Uh, so we don't, we are not so much bothered about this. Uh, and even at this time, um, it was possible to have some good moments in life. So I decided to show you this picture with a rabbit. Um, they chase a rabbit, uh, a nice fluffy animal. So some some, some moments of bright uh, brightness and, and even having having fun, although almost all the time, this kind of fear that maybe someone can denounce on them. Um, here, just a close up for uh, so you can see it. These girls. Um, another uh, aspect of um, hiding uh, and and help provided to Jewish people uh, was a help to Jewish children. Uh, I mentioned Leon Feiner, the co-creator of Jagota, um, aid to Jewish people. Um, which was a part of the, um, by the way, underground government in Poland. So this was this organization, uh, which unfortunately was established really late, uh, somewhere in December 1942, when most of the ghettos were liquidated and most of Jewish people perished in the death camps. We had six death camps in Poland. Uh, and uh, um, um, here is the story of Katarzyna Meloch. Uh, you can see her uh, to the left, my my left, um, smiling girl uh, who uh, uh, who stayed in a, um, a convent uh, in a kind of orphanage in Turkowice. Um, many Jewish children. It was possible to 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 save many uh, Jewish children and. This act of organizing this help already started somewhere in the ghetto. There were Polish messengers who helped the Jewish people to find places for Jewish children so they could um, stay there quite safely and uh, and survive the war as Christian uh, children. So an important part of this process of rescuing Jewish uh, children. Um, and uh, re returning to, to also uh, hiding places, uh, returning to this uh, photos of Rudolf Dametz uh, of Warsaw, um, you need to imagine uh, that this hiding uh, and fighting and hiding place was a process. A Jewish person was sometimes wandering from one person to another until they found something which was um, more permanent place to stay. And uh, um, I wanted to recall uh, um, an account of Ignacy Bierzyński Burnet, who uh, escaped from the forced labor camp in uh, Bliżen, and he came to Warsaw in December 43. So it's already a few months after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And uh, he was there with a friend, and uh, this is what he uh, how how he describes one of these uh, temporary uh, hiding places. 
so he this is his uh, his account uh, when we got to the courtyard uh, we saw a building in front of us a huge dustbin at the other end of the courtyard and behind it a sign indicated a public toilet it was a typical large warsaw townhouse without hesitating we entered the toilet to the left was a ruin uh, urinal uh, that, uh, that had long uh, ago been painted black. Above, it was a, a recess almost two meters above the floor with a window, the only one in the entire toilet. In this niche, crouching down, Staszek spent his first night in Warsaw. He went on to use the same spot several times. There were four stalls in the toilet separated by brick walls about two meters high with cement floors. We locked ourselves in one of them. While waiting there, we had to devise a strategy. It was too early to um, go entering strangers' flats in occupied Warsaw and asking for our friend. We decided to change styles every few minutes so as not to raise any suspicions as to why one of them was constantly occupied. We kept silent when someone else was inside another style or was using the urinal. Time was passing. We um, we probably uh, changed styles 50 times, not arousing any suspicions. Uh, various people were coming in and out. Evening came and it was dark. There was, of course, no light in the toilet. So I, I, I think horrible, horrible situation. In general, this is so surreal <laughs> that you need to hide, that you need to hide your identity and that you need to make such a great effort, like changing 50 times the toilet so you will not arouse any suspicion, suspicions. Um, but this is the, 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 the like a description of the kind of temporary hiding place and i would like now to uh, shift to, uh, to 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 tell you more about this uh, permanent uh, hiding places but before i go to that i want to also tell you about this difference between hiding in a city and hiding in a village because these are completely two different um completely two different um, uh, completely two different things uh, and uh, um, uh, hiding hiding in a in a in a in a forest is, is something which is uh, uh, starting uh, in Polish village uh, somewhere in uh, in uh, uh, in autumn of uh, 42 just to remind you in uh, in mid 1941 uh, there were already organized some mass executions by the Einsatzgruppe and special forces uh, like special operation groups um, um, and at the end of 1941 the first executions using gas chambers took place and uh, uh, on January 1942 during the Van Zee conference near Berlin uh, there was a decision made, uh, the plan for the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe and the liquidation of ghettos and uh, mass extermination of Jewish people began on March uh, 1942, when uh, 1,600 people were sent from the Lublin ghetto to the camp of Belzec. And uh, this was happening, the mass uh, extermination and those who were able to left to somehow uh, escape from uh, from um, from on, on their way to extermination camp, for instance, or who were able to 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 left the ghetto before its liquidation in summer 1942, they had to go to forests. That was the only possible way in the beginning to find a hiding place. So um, this uh, second half, especially autumn, winter uh, 1942 was extremely difficult because the Jewish people were exposed to the so-called Judenjagd, which means hunting for Jews, in which unfortunately local Polish population also played a disgraceful role. And uh, uh, this is this is what is uh, what is happening to to Jewish uh, 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 people. And uh, for how long you can stay uh, in uh, in a forest? Uh, well, not for so long, 
uh, but uh, uh, because it's getting colder and colder. And at that time, uh, eight years ago, uh, winter was really harsh in Poland. So I would like to uh, quote another um, uh, um, account of Rivka Potash, uh, who was hiding in um, in one of the villages in the forest, and how it was to be. By the way, just look at this woman. Uh, this is another uh, picture we have in our collection, really unique. Um, uh, this women are even somehow smiling. By the way, most almost all the people par portrayed are in a way somehow smiling, although they are in a completely they're in, in a horrible condition. Uh, and uh, Rivka, Rivka Potash uh, wrote, uh, we have been hiding in a forest for a few days. We have nothing to eat. We barely made it out alive. We are barefoot. We can't sleep due to the cold. Uh, we hold each other tightly. I snuggle against the children and they snuggle against me, but we cannot sleep. We collect uh, berries and cranberries found in the forest. That's not enough, of course. Nobody is complaining, but I can see that my children are killed by hunger during the day and by cold at night. So imagine how it was to be in such condition. Um, and uh, it was crucial to find a hiding place somewhere in a village at some Polish peasant's place. And uh, um, here, uh, um, I, I return to this uh, drawings by Susanna Kofta, another part, another uh, another one from the series, uh, which present a man called Ephraim uh, who came barefoot with uh, with almost no clothes uh, in kind of pajama. Uh, he was able to. He he was he was uh, he was the one who avoided a kind of mm, mm, death in a, in a pit, the German people and this Einsatzgruppen, as I told you, were uh, killing, mass, it was a mass killing in the pits and he pretended he was shot and at night he was able to escape. And he, um, like a half a life, uh, visited, thank God, the neighbors he knew and they accepted him. And, that, uh, and then, of course, there was an issue of building a, a hiding uh, place. Um, uh, construction of this hiding place really needed a lot of invention. And uh, if uh, uh, a person in hiding and those who were helping him or her or them didn't uh, pay enough attention to the neighborhood, unfortunately, uh, horrible events might um, happen and happened. Uh, here I present a photo, it's not from a uh, Pauline Museum, it's from digital um, collection of the Markova Ulma Museum uh, of Polish people who saved Jewish people during World War II. And it's uh, it's famous because it's presenting three Jewish brothers from the Goldman family that were in hiding in Markova, probably somewhere in 1943. And because um, the Ulma family and the Goldman family didn't somehow uh, stay safe enough they were, as you see in the courtyard, people knew that they are there. Um, one of the policemen denunciated on Ulma family and in Markova, a horrible crime uh, happened in March 40, uh, 44, uh, where all the uh, people, Jewish people and Polish people were killed. So as you see the consequences, uh, the consequence was death. Um, these people, uh, were uh, exhumated and moved after the war to some war cemetery. And only now we were able to somehow uh, recognize them and find their names and, and, and locate their names. Um, a few more uh, drawings from uh, Zuzanna Kofta. Um, I, I feel really touched when I see this, uh, this uh, drawings also because I know the stories behind. Uh, for instance, this is a room in Stanislavov, which is ivano Frankisk now in Ukraine. And the Chyshevsky family uh, was hiding 11 people in one room. So this uh, is presenting how these 11 people lived on daily basis. Uh, someone hugging somebody, somebody is some, some reading something. Somebody is just uh, sitting, doing nothing. Somebody uh, decided to just have a nap. 
and in some critical situations, these people uh, had to hide in the basement. Um, and really small, small, small space. One, uh, there, there are countless accounts of Jewish people uh, uh, recalling how they were hiding in some uh, dugout, uh, which was uh, which was uh, somehow uh, prepared with some wooden shores, and about three or four meters uh, in size and two meters high. Uh, no floor um, uh, and only a small stove uh, and a small lamp and that's it and sometimes they could barely breathe and imagine spending uh, in such situations for many many months in such horrible uh, conditions uh, so this uh, account of 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 uh, of a shock for the people staying in such conditions is quite often um, repeating uh, itself in many uh, accounts. Um, um, as the time is uh, passing uh, by, I will uh, probably move to the film uh, presentation uh, just to uh, maybe give you some, some remarks here. I wanted to tell you a story of a person who was hiding under these mattresses just in case. So imagine staying under such mattresses. Um, 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 and the important uh, thing to, to mention is, uh, is the role of a person who is, is, who is called a bucket person. So a person who is wandering from hiding place to, to the, to, to the, to, from the courtyard to the hiding place. The hiding place could be in the barn around in the barn or somewhere nearby the toilet uh, and this bucket is uh, um, is a symbol of hiding uh, because uh, in the bucket a person uh, who was helping Jewish people in hiding was uh, uh, bringing them food and then uh, was uh, um, also uh, they were delivering them what left in the toilet so the bucket is uh, as symbolic as the wardrobe obviously in which many, many people uh, uh, had to hide uh, to survive and save their lives. Um, another, uh, another uh, like really dramatic um, part of uh, and uh, uh, of, of hiding is also hiding in some really small spaces uh, uh, where uh, almost nobody could move. Uh, so not even two meters high. Uh, there were hiding places in which some people stayed for many months, uh, like in a horizon, horizontal, yes, position. And here I, uh, here, here's Susanna Kofta pictured, um, uh, like uh, two, two, two men hiding in this way. And uh, just to give you uh, an example that this is something real that happened, uh, I wanted to present to you uh, archive, photo archive of Natalia Romik, uh, who is a visual artist and uh, and also a researcher. Um, uh, just before the pandemic, she was able to do a research on Jewish uh, hiding places, and here indeed she she made the research and she confirmed that at the Jewish cemetery on Okopova Street in Warsaw there was a hiding place. Um, you can see Natalia to my uh, right. Uh, she she went she get there inside and she did a special uh, research she was um, investigating many hiding places to prove is something that was told in the account um, written account or after the war in a testimony uh, is really real so she also made the research um, documenting uh, one of the trees in which indeed there was a hiding place and on the basis of this uh, research, she uh, created sculptures, uh, as you see to the left, the silver uh, sculpture is part of this tree. Uh, she was able to, to, to prepare such, um, such sculpture as an inspiration uh, after she did the research in which she found out that indeed there are traces, there was a, uh, there was a hiding place in a, um, in a tree that was in Wisniowa village, which is Podkarpacie region in uh, Poland. And at the end of my presentation, I wanted to show you a picture which was probably taken uh, after the war uh, because 
It is, uh, it is definitely a kind uh, of a reconstruction of how hiding looked like. And for many years in Poland, in many documents, this photo was like circulating as a as a photo taken at the time of the hiding, but probably it was not. Uh, so this is Abraham Greenbaum and Helena Garbarek, uh, a Polish woman who was uh, hiding Abraham for three years. Imagine three years staying somewhere in a barn uh, in cold uh, temperature or really extremely hot temperature in summer. Uh, so this this photo is, uh, if you know the context, um, even if it was uh, reconstructed, um, is uh, of course uh, presenting how horrifying experience it was to be in the hiding for for so many many uh, years. And um, at the end of my presentation, I would like to uh, invite you to watch together with me a film by um, Józef Markiewicz. Uh, he's my colleague at the uh, Pauline Museum. He's a senior specialist on oral history. And uh, uh, on the 18th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, uh, we have decided to record some of the children of the Holocaust uh, once again. So there is an association um for uh people who survived uh, the holocaust in poland as children and uh we have decided to uh, return to these people to uh, record them once again and i'm really proud of this project because uh, we were able to uh to really create a full uh, biographical account uh, because quite often if we, we had such a, a such a experience that if you record the Holocaust survivor two hours or three hours of the account is about this five years of being in hiding surviving the Holocaust and only five minutes about the life what happened next and uh, something happened now Either we changed our attitude or maybe it's because it is so late that thanks to this perspective of 80 years uh, from the uprising, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, we are able to recall these people once again. And Irena Agata Bodak told us about the experience on how she was hiding in the ghetto, how she was hiding on the so-called Aryan side and how most of her life she was hiding her Jewish identity. And what she told us was absolutely shocking. So I uh, I invite you now to see the um, to see this uh, film with me, uh, and I hope everything technically will be fine. Uh, let me share the film. Uh, okay, I start. Uh, Mojemu wnukowi wymyśliłam wierszyk. Koci, koci, łapci, jedziemy do babci, ale ani słówka, bo babcia żydówka. A to jest zdjęcie, z kiedy by, mieszkałam w Bursie. Już to jest mój pierwszy mąż i dziecko. Kiedy wszyscy już zaczęliśmy mieć swoje rodziny, swoje dzieci. Dlaczego ja siebie wycięłam? To był jeden, jedna z prób ucieczki przed sobą samym. Że ktoś mnie zobaczy, ktoś mnie rozpozna, ktoś mnie skaże na coś i że z tego będą same nieprzyjemności. Trzeba zacząć od tego, pójścia do getta. Tak jak wspominałam o tym plakacie, który wywarł na mnie straszne wrażenie i żył ze mną, nie wiem, może do dzisiaj jeszcze, że była to podobizna karykatura Żyda, która była w getcie rozklejana i było napisane Żyd równa się tyfus plus wszy. 
jeszcze wcześniej można powiedzieć, że ja dowiedziałam się właśnie, że jestem Żydówką jako siedmioletnie dziecko idąc do getta. To był pierwszy wstrząs, ponieważ uważałam, że ja jestem taka sama jak inne dzieci, a to się nagle okazało, że ja jestem inna, w dodatku mam wszy, tak myśli dziecko i w ogóle muszę być izolowana. Pierwszy wstrząs był z tym plakatem. Raz, dwa, trzy, cztery, pięć. Było takie półkoliste okno. Ja na takim oknie, takim właśnie, siedziałam większą część dnia. Ciekawa jestem, czy tam mieszkają ludzie? Na pewno. Nie można było wyjść, rodzice mnie nie wypuszczali. Nie mam pojęcia, gdzie rodzice zdobywali jedzenie. Pamiętam tylko ojca, który taki miał rulonik pieniędzy i mówił, że to już ostatnie. Bardzo byłam chroniona. Nie mówiono przy mnie o różnych rzeczach. Wielu rzeczy nie wiedziałam. Nic się nie robiło. Miałam jakieś książeczki. Wtedy już umiałam czytać jakieś książeczki. Okropne czytałam. Była jakaś książeczka Jakiewicza chyba o dziecku, które wypadło i, i ząbki się posypały na trotuarze. I ja pamiętam, że to było coś okropnego. Jeszcze bym tamtą dom chciała zobaczyć. Pewne rzeczy pamiętam dokładnie, a niektórych wcale, tak jak sprawa z moją siostrą i ojcem, do dziś we mnie budzi niesamowite chęci poznania z jednej strony, a z drugiej strony okropny strach, żeby nie poznać, jak to było naprawdę. Więc ja tą sięgną jeszcze chyba nie przeszłam do końca. Ja się jej boję. To, to jest ulica, która budzi we mnie strach. Ja wiem, że teraz jest inaczej i że parę razy próbowałam. Jak zaczynam na brzegu, nawet zaczynam chodzić, że coś się strasznego stanie, nie wiem. Po prostu się jej boję. Dlatego, że byłam potem tam przy tej szkole. Jest mur, przy którym ja odsłaniałam tą tablicę. Chodziłam do tej szkoły, spotykałam się z uczniami. Mur jako mur, jako cegła, budzi zawsze we mnie takie ograniczenie, ograniczenie wolności. Nawet kiedyś była jakaś francuska telewizja i chciała wywiad ze mną, ale z drugiej strony muru. I ja się bardzo niekomfortowo czułam wtedy. Pamiętam, że byłam bardzo zdenerwowana. No, jakoś tam to wszystko poszło. Ten mur widziałam wtedy tak jakby od strony geta, ale nie mogę przezwyciężyć tego uczucia, tak jak nie mogę przezwyciężyć strachu i uczucia negatywnego przy jakiejkolwiek dziurze w podłodze. To jest nie do przejścia. Ja po prostu sztywnieję kiedyś u znajomych byłam, była tam wejście do piwnicy, było otwarte, ja musiałam przejść koło tego, nie wejść tam, przejść. Ja tak zasztywniałam, że mnie musieli przeprowadzić, po prostu dosłownie. Tak jakakolwiek dziura, otwór, gdzie ja bym musiała włożyć głowę, tak na mnie działa do dzisiaj. Po tej ucieczce z getta z moją matką, która sama w sobie jest opowieścią oddzielną, ale chcę wrócić do wątku, który zaczęłam właśnie, jaki wpływ miał. Wszędzie byłam uważana za osobę gorszą i za taką się uważałam. Spotkała mnie jedna pani w jakimś takim uzdrowisku, gdzie pracowałam w bibliotece i zapytała się, czy ja jestem Żydówka i powiedziałam, że tak, to dlaczego ja tu jestem, bo, bo wszyscy Żydzi wyjechali do Izraela i co ja tu sama robię, ja miałam wtedy chyba 16 lat, to chcesz wyjechać, ja mówię, ja nie, nie, nie wiem, ale potem jak sobie pomyślałam, że ja mam wrócić do czasu z, z getta, i że ja znowu będę w środowisku, ja sobie nie wyobrażałam życia w Izraelu, że jest po wojnie zupełnie inaczej, tylko dla mnie się to wiązało z pobytem w decie. W związku z tym yy, bardzo nie chciałam jechać, żeby 
Nie chciałam wracać do, do spraw żydowskich po prostu. Chciałam, stale, stale czułam się, sama się czułam ukrywana przez siebie. Jeszcze wcześniej to poczucie prześladowało mnie w każdym momencie i w każdym aspekcie mojego życia. Ja uważałam, że Żydzi to jest coś gorszego, że ja absolutnie się nie zgadzam na to, żeby być i że jeszcze prze, przed tym i że ja nie chcę przy tym być. I to się przekładało na wszystkie moje związki międzyludzkie. Po pierwsze brak poczucia stałości, brak poczucia godności i brak poczucia bezpieczeństwa. Wszystkie związki międzyludzkie wydawały mi się na chwilę, że one tak będą przebiegały i że nie warto się tutaj w ogóle w nic angażować i że tylko trzeba patrzeć na to, żeby zapewnić sobie drogę ucieczki. Ja stale myślałam o ucieczce, w związku z tym od pierwszego męża uciekłam, chociaż też był Żydem. Uciekałam potem wiele razy i to się przekształciło w taką obsesję, że ja w jakiejś stresowej sytuacji złapałam się na tym, że ja chcę uciekać z własnego domu, tu już, jako dorosła osoba, nie, nie uświadamiając sobie, że ja jestem w własnym domu. Ta potrzeba chowania się, potrzeba ucieczki była we mnie tak silna, że ona naprawdę wszystkie dziedziny życia obejmowała. I jeszcze jest dużo takich wątków, o których nie jestem w stanie opowiedzieć, ale wszystko to sprzyjało temu, że ja ciągle będąc Żydówką nie chciałam być Żydówką i że doszukiwałam się i w sobie i w narodzie wszystkich złych cech. I to bardzo mi przeszkadzało w życiu. I któregoś razu leciałam do Bukaresztu samolotem i koło mnie siedział Taki pan, który na bagażu miał napisane na tam jakieś tam żydowskie nazwisko i zaczęliśmy rozmawiać. Ja mu to powiedziałam, że ja mam takie. I on powiedział, dziecko, bo ty nie znasz inteligencji żydowskiej, nie znasz kultury żydowskiej, nie wiesz, co to wszystko znaczy. Ty ciągle widzisz tego Żyda z getta. I rzeczywiście, jak patrzyłam na obrazy Szagala, to wszyscy ludzie twierdzili no arcydzieło i tak dalej, a ja widziałam geto, ja widziałam tych fruwających Żydów, że to było, to było straszne. Trochę ta rozmowa mi dała do myślenia. Potem już w późniejszych latach pojechałam do Izraela i byłam pod ścianą płaczu i mówiłam to wcześniejszym tym, że to był taki przełom w moim życiu, bo to była pewnego rodzaju zgoda moja wewnętrzna na bycie Żydówką i akceptacja bardzo dla mnie burzliwa i bardzo wstrząsająca. Ja to bardzo przeżyłam. I, i, i zaczęłam zmieniać pod, podejście, myśleć o tym. Przez dłuższy czas nawet nie wiedziałam, że ten szczątek muru tu jest. I prawdę mówiąc, nie interesowałam się tym. Wszystko jakoś odżyło w momencie, jak powstało Stowarzyszenie Dzieci Holokaustu. To zaczęło się. No, jak się pół życia zaprzecza, że się jest Żydówką, a drugie pół życia się usiłuje to odbudować i zaakceptować i połączyć tą, 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 tą skwiejną tożsamość w całość, to może nic dziwnego, ale czasem się sobie dziwię, że się tak nie zajmowałam tymi sprawami. Nie wiem, czy tu jeszcze przyjdę, nie, nie, nie sądzę, ale chciałam przyjść na sienno i chciałam kawałek na sienno iść. Dzisiejsze spotkanie w myślach, o nim myślę tak, że jest to ostatni spacer na sienno.
um so so that was the uh, the film uh, based on the account and uh, uh i'm always touched when i uh, watch this uh, video uh, because when uh, irena talks about this shaky identity uh, and this uh, this agreement to be Jewish um, and this how how turbulent was this process of acceptance? I feel really um, like her her experience uh, like with all myself in, in a way. I feel it somewhere in my body. Um, also maybe because I I read so many Holocaust stories and I also interviewed so many people on uh, on hiding. Um, 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 I guess that's it. Um, I would like to invite you to send me some questions uh, if you have any. Um, and um, yes, that's, I guess, the end of my presentation. I'll just jump back in, Joanna. Thank you so much for that. It was so informative and so powerful that film is very uh, is very powerful and I was struck watching it thinking about um how it how it sort of wraps up your presentation that we're watching this uh this woman narrate the story about um hiding but uh, I mean the really powerful part of that um of that film is about is about her um if I can say you know hiding hiding from herself and re in flight in in flight from herself and uh, and then um it's really striking at the end when she talks about this process of of sort of destroying your own identity and then spending the second or the, the majority of your life trying to rebuild your identity it was very powerful and uh yes absolutely um for our um, online participants if they could use the q a function if they want to ask a question that would be wonderful and um I i'll take the I'll take the opportunity if I can as the as the host if you don't mind I'll ask the first question um sure. which is I I was wondering I was really struck by the first part of your presentation when you were juxtaposing the different ways in which people were hiding or in the different places because I think we often think about sort of the Anne Frank paradigm you know of these sort of constructed hiding places which you talked about um but you talked also about people, you know, having to having to subsist outside. But I was fascinated by this idea of of people the um, the risk and the courage of hiding in plain sight. Um, and I wondered, uh, firstly, if you had a sense of, you know, how many how many people chose to do that? How chose to try to uh, live sort of uh, Aryanized versus how many people were were actually. Um, in hiding was it was it a relatively small number of people who tried who you know who dyed their hair and got forged documents or uh yes uh, so this is uh, indeed an important information i should provide you with uh so uh there are estimations we don't have any correct numbers because this is a paradox of a polish case and even professor dariusz stola uh, a historian who used to be a director of our museum, he said that in context of numbers, victims in Polish context, we can talk about guests and not real statistics. So the, um, to answer your question, uh, there are estimations that uh, uh, for, uh, 40 to 50,000 people were able to survive in hiding, most of them in hiding, uh, not so many people who just survived in a death camp we because or, or labor camps uh, because there is such a small group of Jewish people uh, like Samuel Willenberg who was able to escape from Treblinka death camp when there was a kind of rebellion in August 43. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, out of this three million Jewish people before the war uh, probably uh, sorry, I have always problems with numbers in English. 200,000, 250,000 people survived, most of them in USSR. Uh, so these are the Jewish people who were able to escape uh, Poland uh, just in the beginning of the war. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, around 40,000, uh, 40, 50,000 were able to survive in hiding. How many of them on the surface? 
I don't have such calculations. I can track, I can check some somewhere and let you know if, if, if there are any, but I will check it. How many uh, of them in the surf on the surface, how many underground? I don't know. I will tell you, but maybe later. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I didn't assume that there were there were uh, you know certain numbers. I wondered sort of about the you know the the ratio. This yes. There are estimations, and you need to also know that just after the war, um, the Jew, the Jew, there was a so-called Jewish committee, and many people uh, were registering and telling the story uh, how they survived in hiding. But many of the people, even after the war, decided to keep a low profile and not they they didn't want to recognize to be recognized as Jewish people for many, many years, and many of them also left the country very quickly, as fast as it was possible, especially after pogrom in Kielce in 1947, 46, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a couple other questions, questions that are coming in through the, through the chat. Um, uh, the Alberta government announced 10 days ago that uh, studying the Holocaust will be a compulsory part of the province's new social studies curriculum. So the question, why is Holocaust education important? And what are the lessons we should be trying to share with our youth and young students related to this important part of history? Uh, why it is so important? Um, uh, I uh, That's a kind of uh, ethical question in a way. Um, I uh, feel uh, we are, uh, especially as Polish people, obliged to tell the story of the Holocaust, which part of this, of the European Holocaust, happened in Poland. Uh, and this is our kind of civil duty. Um, mm, uh, and for many, many years, I've been documenting the stories. Uh, and... Um, to be honest, I feel I, I with with the with the with the events also of rising anti-Semitism uh, all over Europe now, uh, it might be even more difficult now to learn about Holocaust and to teach about the Holocaust. But still, we shall not abandon the topic. Uh, the history of the Holocaust is an important part of Polish history. Also, Polish people have really various attitudes toward this Holocaust. They are, many of them are not able to accept also bad things that were happening between Polish people and Jewish people. So uh, uh, teaching and learning, it's bilateral always, uh, about the Holocaust, about the uh, uh, result of extreme anti-Semitism and racism and uh, how it ended in gas chambers uh, is, I think important part, not only of historical knowledge, but also a kind of civil education. Um, it's important to build a society, in my opinion, in Polish context, um, a society which is somehow based on the true and is able to accept a really difficult uh, history. Uh, and it's important to build the better future. Um, Unfortunately, um, all these phrases like never again, which you can even uh, mm -hmm. see at many monuments, Holocaust monuments, never again about the genocides is, um, is unfortunately some kind of empty sentence, I feel. Uh, people do not, uh, people do not uh, learn from each other, especially if genocides happened in different um geographically in different areas um but still i i believe uh, that the story of the holocaust uh, uh is uh, is giving us uh, what happened in poland gives us a kind of moral obligation uh, to uh, avoid uh, anti-semitism to avoid racism and to build societies uh, which are able to to build a platform for dialogue between different people uh, who have different opinions. Um, this is what I believe personally. Uh, and I guess I will not stop doing this. Um, I'm not sure is it convincing, I don't know. I guess everyone should find his and her own explanation to this question. Well, it's a very, it's a very challenging 
paradox in a way that you're as you're saying like this is a very um uh, it's it's a, it's a, a terrible and difficult history to have to face and to have to face you know the factual reality of it but that it's necessary um i guess this is the paradox that it's necessary to face that so that you can go forward and build a society that is that that has these strong um foundations a civil society that that values um dialogue and tolerance and all of the things that are absence from this history if i can may add something um uh, because i'm a generation uh who, who didn't exactly witness the communism in poland but communism was a system political system which was uh, uh in, in during which uh, this this time uh Polish people were not able to talk openly about history and many aspects and many uh, um, it, it, so, some of the topics couldn't be discussed openly. Um, even if the Holocaust uh, uh, was important part, uh, for instance, in literature, because in the 60s, uh, one of the most important novels is being created by Bogdan Wojdowski about the Warsaw Ghetto, still, uh, uh there wasn't no this there was no platform and uh, uh no let's say jewish issue until march 68 events when there was an anti-semitic campaign following which uh, over 10,000 year uh, 10,000 uh, jewish people left uh, the country they were forced to emigrate so 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 many things happened also after the war that this history of the holocaust uh definitely in this polish context of building a civil society is 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 a, is a founding story in a way um also in building a, a democracy in poland this is what i really believe maybe i am naive in that but i believe that through understanding and accepting what happened in german occupied poland uh we can really move somehow forward to to build a society of definitely my dreams but maybe i am i am probably naive <laughs> yes i am um let me let me uh, ask another question if i may from the chat um the question is you have mentioned the impact of acculturation on the on hiding and survival strategies what about social integration and religious affiliations of the people more specifically, what can you say about um, the hiding strategies of more traditional sections of the Jewish community? For example, um, the Hasidim. Uh, um, I, I mentioned in my in my presentation that uh, the biggest chance to survive was to to know, of course, the Polish language fluently and definitely not like a religious Jewish person and Hasidim uh, Hasidim. Uh, Hasidic uh, Jewish people, well, definitely um, uh, were those who unfortunately perished in the in the Holocaust and didn't have much chance to survive. But uh, there are stories of people who were not so acculturated and still were able to survive. I recall a history of uh, uh, Tsipa Gorodecka, her, her mother, who uh, didn't speak a good uh, Polish language, uh, her mother tongue was Yiddish, and uh, there are accounts of uh, such people um, who, who, are, um, uh, who are pretending they are deaf people, that they can't uh, hear anyone, and that's how they survived. They were pretending they can't hear anything. And so there are such accounts, and one of them is the mother of Tsipa Gorodecka, the one I know uh, it's confirmed, and there was also a reportage by Hanna Kral about this. As for Hasidic uh, people, um, there are some really, I think, few stories, uh, uh, or for, for instance, of Hasidic people uh, hiding in the cemeteries, uh, in a strict, like, close area, um, I don't know what was their fate and were they able to survive or not, but we have a really interesting article about it on our website, the Polish Righteous website. There is a section about uh, various contexts of Holocaust and its author is uh, Krzysztof Bielawski, who is a great expert on Jewish um, cemeteries, and he, he, he found such stories of religious Jewish people who were in hiding. Uh, as far as I remember the article, unfortunately, sometimes we don't know did they succeed or not. Um, not so many of them succeeded. 
there are such stories. So if there is a resource. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for pointing us to that resource. Um, as I as we we're, as we come to the end of our time, I'll, um, there's a, one sort of last question if I could ask you to address it, and it, and it links actually to uh, we have an event later this week. Uh, we have a, a, a lecture on the global context of the Holocaust. So the question is about what you what you think about the general awareness of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism globally today, which you've touched on a little bit. But why, you know, why, for example, is is Holocaust denial still a, a, a global phenomenon? Partly, Do, if you have any thoughts about that. Um, do I have any thoughts on that? Well, there are there are special uh, surveys which were done uh, just before the pandemic. Um, I can send you later on uh, information about this uh, this survey. Uh, uh, and uh, in particular, uh, the CNN uh, survey was uh, somehow researching on how knowledge about the Holocaust is perceived uh, in various European countries. And um, I remember interesting and somehow significant differences. Uh, um, so for instance, I remember there is a case of French people who, uh, French students who don't know exactly the, well the history of the Holocaust. And in this aspect, uh, the, po the Polish group looked quite good, uh, um, but I, I don't exactly remember the, the data and the numbers. Uh, at the same time, there was another separated survey made among the Polish Jewish in Poland. And they were also asked these questions. They were asked various questions also, also about how they just feel as Jewish people in Poland now, uh, just to, to, to remind you there, again, estimations uh, that there are like 20, 20, maybe 20,000 Jewish people uh, in Poland who like openly identify themselves as Jewish people. Uh, so it is a uh, really small group of uh, people. Many of them do not belong to uh, Jewish communities. Um, not everyone wants to be a part of the Jewish community in Warsaw and Wrocław. Uh, but um, the Holocaust denial, uh, why why it exists? I guess it 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 depends on a on the group uh, and and context. Uh, it's uh, completely different. Uh, if if you if you learn about those who deny the history of Holocaust in France from let's say Muslim uh, min minority, there are different reasons for that. Uh, in many aspects, it's I believe lack of knowledge. Uh, we as Polish people, um, I I I think uh, the Polish society uh, knows the history of the Holocaust quite well. It knows it happened. Uh, it uh, the, the, I, I recall one of the sentences of Professor Jacek Leoczak, a distinguished uh, uh, historian of literature. He said the Polish peasant was digging in a soil and on the same soil at the same time, uh, the ashes of Jewish people were uh, in a way flowing down. And uh, so, 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 so Polish people were really like eyewitnesses of what happened. And obviously then the transmission of the history of Jewish faith uh, happened. Uh, so uh, if, if an eyewitness uh, uh, a, a person who saw, who experienced, was able to transfer the knowledge, then definitely uh, there is no such a phenomenon as denial of the Holocaust in Poland. But I can imagine that in other nations, which are geographically more far away from this historical context, uh, I think France is a, maybe, maybe let's say, well, France, I don't want to, I have nothing against French people. And I'm sorry, I just remember this France issue from the survey uh, made by CNN. Um, but I, I can imagine that if there is a diverse uh, society in which there are many people coming from various countries, and if the country, for instance, is dealing with its post-colonial past, it's in a way uh, uh, harder to 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 learn about Holocaust, to teach Holocaust, and to uh, accept this uh, this history. Um, 
Mm, I guess this is this might be one of the reasons. Um, but the base is lack of knowledge, I guess. Uh, yes. Okay. Mm. Well, well, I mean, related to that, maybe uh, just by way of conclusion, can I ask you if you'd like to say a few a few words about um, about the museum in Poland and uh, and uh, the Poland Museum the and the resources that are available there. Um, there's online resources. I know there's in-person resources. Um, um, of course, uh, of course. So um, obviously, if I uh, were my director, I would say that the biggest resource is our core exhibition. And it's a beautifully designed, huge resource, uh, which I really encourage you to, to visit if you have such a chance. Uh, because it's uh, 1,000 years of history, uh, the visitors uh, can uh, can learn uh, can uh, can discover this history uh, via various media. But what is really important is that at this core exhibition, there are uh, collected um, uh, testimonies and accounts uh, from Jewish people uh, from historical uh, period. So if somebody witnessed something in the Middle Ages, there is a quote from really Middle Ages. So the research for this exhibition was absolutely amazing. And uh, this is really important, uh, uh, significant, one of the most important <laughs> core exhibitions, I believe that is, was created. Uh, definitely in this part of Europe, if it comes to Jewish history. As for uh, resources online, obviously I encourage you to visit our website, the Virtual Shtetl, um, on which we present a history of um, approximately 1,800, uh, um, well, shtetls. Uh, shtetl, uh, by this word, we think of a uh, Jewish community that existed in the Polish uh, land uh, through the ages and the territory of Poland was changing quite often. Um, so uh, you will find information about Jewish community, its history uh, and many details about Jewish organizations, education, a charity. Uh, in addition, a lot of biographies. Um, now, of course, we are in a kind of uh, movement of also returning uh, Jewish women voice to this history. So, um, so this is an important resource. And uh, I encourage you to visit our um, uh, oral history channel on YouTube. We have made a um, not so popular decision to upload some part of our collection of our oral history. Uh, not so popular because you know we know YouTube is commercial, but at the same time, this is really easily accessible. So you can find their selected um, selected uh, testimonies, uh, both uh, various groups, uh, Jewish representatives, uh, now uh, 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 Holocaust survivors, also Polish righteous among the nations. We have over one thousand. Uh, testimonies and around 200 is presented at this YouTube channel. Um, we are working, we are building now a special website to present our collection, uh, the, the digital images of our collection and our collection is, in my opinion, really impressive. Um, uh, it's divided into, uh, I would say, uh, Two important groups: museum objects uh, and archival uh, archival collection. Um, um, already thousands of objects uh, related to uh, Jewish uh, uh, Jewish life, uh, daily history, um, and uh, in case of this archival collection, almost every object has its own story behind. Uh, uh, this is a collection which was created by. Uh, those who donated this object. So we were not only um, um, documenting the object as we should in every museum properly, but also uh, a, a person who donated the object is like equally important because uh, she or he tell, told us a story of this object. Ed. But this is unfortunately a work in progress. I also uh, encourage you to use our website, the Polish Righteous, uh, uh, and uh, we are presenting uh, around 1,000 stories of rescue, 5,000 uh, people. Five, so it's 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 about 5,000 uh, recordings, personal recordings there. And 
The most important part, uh, obviously, is uh, this part unit of stories of rescue. But at the same um, at the time, I encourage you to visit the, the Holocaust section on this website. Uh, in which you can find uh, all this important information uh, about the context, historical context on how Holocaust was implemented in the Polish lands and uh, what was the, uh, the attitude of the Polish society towards Jewish people during the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. um, so we are developing this, uh, this information and I hope next year we will be able also to rebuild the mini so it will be easier to navigate. And last, last but not least, you can always, if you look for something, uh, uh, ask me a question or you can send a question to our resource center. There are experts, researchers uh, who, um, who do uh, a research both in our uh, collections and uh, outside collections. We are also partner uh, with the USC Shah Foundation. So you can also do a research uh, in the building. You need to come. Um, there is an access point for uh, U.S. Israel Foundation. So, uh, and also the Fortune of Archives. So, uh, we we have these two big partners. Um, I guess uh, that's it. <laughs> yes, for well, for resources. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I see in the chat um, we've we've posted links to the online resources you were as you were describing them. Um, Thank you and, very much. Well, I'd just like to say to our to our audience uh, just to let them know that we've recorded this. Um, presentation. So thank you for allowing us to record it. And we will post this uh, online later in the week. So if anybody was unable to attend or they would like to watch it again, it will be available. But I would like to to thank you very much on behalf of the, the Institute and our, our scholarly community here and our audience. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Although I know the topic is, well, not that um easy um of course i'm i'm very glad i could present uh i'm very glad i could present objects from our collection because i'm crazy about our collection and i believe that through this collection we can really tell touching stories and really touch the history so i'm really glad and thank you for inviting me of course it was fascinating thank you so much thank you thank you good night good night yes or have a good day <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you